right, so if we write if we write the mass balance on the interior, it's it's easy. I mean, it's essentially exactly the same as how we derive the equations. It's just now we're actually plugging in numbers for i and i plus one or l. In this case, we're we're numbering them in terms of of the actual grid numbers. So that's l, right? So in that case, we just plug in the numbers, and it's it's very straightforward. And you can see that we have a term that's like um, T, and it's, it's a little bit hard to see in, in this guy, but right here, this is, well, okay, wow, I'm erasing what was there, that's weird, <laughs> so, sorry about that, but, this has the structure, what I'm trying to make, the point I was trying to make is that this has the structure of the pentadiagonal matrix in that we have uh, a T and a T and a 4T and a T and a T, right? And if you were to just pull the pressures out and to where it was a vector multiplying a matrix, then you would see th that it has the exact same structure as the pentadiagonal matrix. Okay, now when you have no flow boundary conditions, so in this case, this is the, the 11th grid block, which is at the top there against the no flow boundary. And the, when you have a no flow boundary, you, have, you literally have no flow coming in from the top. And in that case, if you remember, this is the flux coming in from the top from the mass balance equation. So that term goes away and there's no flux there. Okay, on the constant pressure boundary condition, we derive this. Uh, you end up with the term that is 2T, and now it's not the inner block transmissibility in that case, it's actually the transmissibility of the nine grid block. So it's 2T times the pressure at the boundary minus the pressure in the grid block. So the pressure in the boundary. So this comes from the fact that you have the same flow, right? You have the same flow between if we're, our room is a grid block and we're standing here, we have the same flow between us and the, and the middle of the room next door, but the middle of the room next door doesn't exist. It ends at the boundary, that's a distance delta x over two. So when you write out the transmissibility in T or in the ninth, T9, the, the ninth grid block, you have a delta x over two in the denominator, the two comes up into the numerator, and so you end up with two T pressure at the boundary minus the pressure at the ninth grid block. And then also, you have this extra term that adds into your, into your uh, Q vector. So at, at Q9, you'd add whatever, if, if you potentially had a well in the ninth grid block and you had a constant pressure boundary condition, then you'd add Q9 plus 2T PB. Otherwise, Q9 is zero if there's no well there then this is zero, and so then it just, the, the ninth entry becomes 2T pressure on the boundary. All right, so what about the corner grid? So in the upper left-hand corner, block grid, uh, grid block 10, there are two no-flow boundaries. And we don't treat those any different, you just treat them one at a time, right? So the one on the top, uh, the one on the top causes this term to go away, so that's the pressure at the top minus the pressure in grid block 10. That term goes away. Uh, and then the one on the side, this is the pressure from the left-hand side minus the pressure in block 10. Those go away, again, because there's no flow. Right. And so when you put everything together, you get this, and again, now you have some holes in there, so everything that's not written out is a zero, right? And you have some holes in there where you normally would have had well, I guess in this case that's in, that, in this case, that's just due to the fact that it's on a boundary. But right here, 
you have a 5t, you have a 5t, right? So in our pentadiagonal structure, we never had a 5 on the diagonal, right? There, at most, it was 4, and it has to do with the number of neighbors. The reason the 5 is there is because there's a constant pressure boundary condition on that grid, which causes the 2t along the diagonal term to be there. Okay. And so here's some, here's some simple rules for applying boundary conditions. <coughs> now, I think when you, if you go back and you remember on the first homework when you created your pentadiagonal matrix, Right? You, there was a series of if statements. Okay? Those if statements were determining if you were on a boundary or, or not, right? I mean, the default case was that you weren't, you just summed up everything. So when you go to write your code uh, for your project, you can just use that same series of if statements to determine when you're constructing your matrix to determine if you're on a boundary, and then you just sort of have a secondary check. I'm okay, I'm on a, you, you know, if you. If any of those if statements are true, you know you're on a boundary. So then you just have to ask, does this boundary have a boundary condition, right? I mean, is there, am I, is there a no-flow condition? Is there a constant pressure boundary condition? And then modify it accordingly. That's one way. The B matrix is unchanged. It's still diagonal. Um, because you had the constant boundary condition along the entire right-hand side, then you have two T, you have four of these terms, because there, there's four grid blocks along the right-hand side, and so you have four terms, two TB, that appear in the Q vector. So uh, this is actually the, the uh, plot I thought I was looking at earlier. So. Everything we talked about so far is a regular reservoir, right? A rectangle. Of course, real reservoirs are not rectangles, right? They, they can have irregular boundaries. And so, up in the right, uh, up in the right-hand corner there, is an example of an irregular um, boundary <coughs> reservoir. And the white areas in the corners are essentially just empty grid blocks. They're like grid blocks that exist but their permeabilities are zero. Right? And this is actually how your project is. You, on the last problem of the project, you have to actually work on a real Benichelic data, data set. And in that case, you have zero for permeabilities in the, in the, off, in the off, um, off the reservoir locations. Right? And of course, because we know how to compute the interblock transmissibility, and we use this thing called the harmonic average, which gives you, if you have zero in the next room and the next room doesn't exist, if you have zero permeability there and that doesn't exist, then you're going to get no flow at the boundary, right? So you don't really have to do anything special in those cases, which makes it kind of nice, right? Kind of nice in one respect in that you don't have to do anything special, which of course uh, brings up another point. And I'm not saying you should do this, uh, but imagine if I now, since I just told you in those white areas, say like in the lower left-hand corner along that curved boundary, I said I don't, you don't have to do anything special. In other words, you treat those green, the green blocks that are just on the inside, the real ones, you treat them as if they're interior grid blocks, right? What is the structure of the matrix for an interior grid block? It's like minus one, minus one, four, minus one, minus one, right? <coughs> whereas, whereas all this other, you know, you have to determine if you're on the boundary, then you get a 3T, something like that. If it's in the interior, it's always minus one, minus one, 4T, minus one, minus one, right? Always. So since for these, uh, these grid blocks that are, that are right here, Right, right along the boundary. So I'm, so I'm saying the ones on the right side of that, the green ones, 
we treat them as their interior grid blocks. So they, their row in the matrix, remember every row in the, in, the, in the transmissibility matrix corresponds to one grid block, right? So their row, all of those, uh, all of those on the right-hand side of my red line there, their row in the matrix would have a structure T, T, minus 4, T, T, T. I'm, I'm sorry, minus T, minus T, 4, T, minus T, minus T, right? So let me let me finish, okay? Okay. So, yeah. You have a question? All right. So, all right. And for those guys, I don't have to do anything different. The matrix has the same structure, and because we're going to compute a harmonic, I just set the permeability of the white grid blocks to the left to zero, and I'll automatically have no flow. It just works. So <laughs> what I'm getting at is. Imagine now if you surrounded your entire reservoir, whether it was regular or irregular. Imagine if you surrounded your entire reservoir on all sides. With a row. Right, of fake grid blocks, or sometimes you might use the word ghost cells. So we're going to surround the entire reservoir with, and if it was, you know, even if it was regular, we just surround it on all four sides by a row of fake grid cells, and set the permeability of all of those to zero. Then my matrix my matrix would be exactly the same everywhere in the, all of the real reservoir would be, it have the exact same structure. Minus T, minus T, 4T, minus T, minus T. And then I just set the ghost cells to permeability to zero, and I could solve the problem without doing anything special on the boundaries. Of course, this, what I just described, only works for no flow boundaries. If you had a constant pressure boundary, you'd have to do something special. And I haven't really thought about how to do that yet. Well, in this case, this is assuming homogeneous. If you had half block transmissibilities, of course, all of these terms would be, you remember when we did it in 1D, it would be like t to the t to the minus 3 halves plus t at the 1 half, something like that, right? Or minus 1 half. So, yeah. I, I hope I, I hope I didn't confuse you there, but I, I just, I'm actually trying to give you a little hint. I mean, not a hint. Please don't feel like you have to do this on your project. I'm just trying to say that that might be easier to just add an extra row of fake grid cells. So you're already using a whole bunch of fake grid cells anyway, right? All of those white areas are fake grid cells. So what's the harm in adding one row across the sides of it, one more extra row, and then just treating the entire matrix the same way for no flow boundaries? Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, <coughs> what in, in, in reality would uh, constant pressure boundaries be? Like well, it depends on what. I mean, you could also model uh, an aquifer as a as a constant flow rate. It, it really just depends on what your data is. What what you, what do you know, right? What's your measurement, <laughs> right? So if you if you're measuring <laughs> the pressure there and you know that it's a constant pressure due to some some inflow of water, then then you can model as a constant pressure. Otherwise, if you knew the flow rate, you could you could do it either way. Well, the, I mean, the, your ghost cells would have to match up with your real ones. So let's see if I can. So let's let's imagine like we zoom in right here, okay? Yeah. We zoom in right there. We're gonna have a real block and a real block, which I'll color red. Mm 
And of course, you know, another one. And more, right? So all of these are real, right? And then you have a ghost and a ghost and a ghost. Okay? If I set k equals to zero in those ghost cells, right? So let's let's now look. Let's look at this grid block. If it's got if it's got neighbors on all sides, whether they're ghosts or not, right, then the mass balance is going to have all the terms, right? So you're going to have minus t, minus t, 4t, minus t, minus t in the matrix, right? So this, this guy is an, in, you know, it's an interior block, so it's going to have its, all the terms in the mass balance. It's just when you compute, when you compute, the inner block transmissibilities here and here on these two sides. When you do that computation, you're going to get zero flux because of the harmonic mean and the fact that you have k equals zero in the back. So it'll it'll always work. Um, it's exactly exactly well yeah it's taking some of the logic out of the code right if if you don't do this you have to have logic in the code that determines if you're on if you're on a boundary and what kind of well if you have to have logic in the code to determine if you're on a boundary right what I'm suggesting is if you just added one fake set all the way around the reservoir, you don't have to have any logic. And then you set all those permeabilities to zero. You don't have to have any logic in the code to determine. Exactly. Yeah. Now what you will have to do is figure out how to properly add that extra row, right? Because they do have to match up. In, a, in other words, you know, if you have a, you know, if you had a real grid block, that's up against the boundary. So this is your real boundary. You can't make a ghost one like that, right? I mean, they, they have to match up perfectly. Right. So this is your ghost. And then you just set k equals 0. And of course, this, is only, you, this would only work if you're actually computing the inner block transmissibilities. Right? If, you have, if, you, if your code is set up to have constant, tra you know, constant transmissibility because it's a homogeneous reservoir, then it's not going to work. It only works if you're actually computing the inner block transmissibilities. So, I mean, it's essentially what you're going to do when you get the Nitulik data set. There's going to be perm there's going to be off the reservoir permeable permeabilities in grid blocks that are off the sides of the reservoir. And unless you want to do something really complicated, you're just going to treat them like they're regular grid blocks and set the permeability to zero and compute the inner block transmissibility. You're, you're going to do that anyway. The, the thing you could do uh, if you wanted to, like, I don't know if it's easy, if you can see, but this is gray and that's white. That would represent that maybe this block doesn't exist because of some irregularity. Um, and that translates to this structure in the, stiff, in the uh, transmissibility matrix. What you'd have to do if you if you didn't want to include all those extra ghost blocks, because the one disadvantage is that you're doing computations on cells that you're just evaluating zeros to, right? So in all of that white area in the lower left corner, you're doing computations, and there might be, you know, I don't know, there, there may be 150 or 200 grid blocks in there that you're looping over, doing computations just to evaluate zeros, which is kind of silly, right? It's simple, but it but it's it's kind of a waste of computational resources. So the next, I mean, the, the more complicated thing you could do is you you basically would number your grid blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then you compute connect, and then you'd have, you'd have some additional information. Uh, we typically would call them a connectivity array. So you'd have a special array that would 1 is connected to 2 and 4, and 2 is connected to 1, 3, and 5, and 7. Remember, I called that 7. 7 would be connected to 8, 5, and 10. Right. 
And you can then use that information to construct your the minimal matrix right, without having these extra grid blocks that you're computing zeros on. Okay. The simple way to do it, in my suggestion, is just to use, you know, treat it like it's a regular grid and just compute those zeros. So the problem we're going to solve in this class, which is not, it's not a small problem, uh, per se. I mean, if you don't code it up right, it, it, your code could run for a long time. So it's not a tiny problem. Um, but nevertheless, it's not billion cells either. Right? If, if you had a billion cells and you had a million of them, that were off the reservoir, you know, you're going to wait for hours for your answer while you're doing computations that evaluate to zero, which is kind of silly. 